The interior of the skull is a fixed space with little to no room for expansion at all. So when the energy from a projectile enters the skull and starts to dissipate, brain tissue is severely compressed. So the gunshot wounds to the face generally result in major soft tissue injuries that immediately threaten the airway. Lung tissue is relatively tolerant of the cavitation caused by the projectile, so the numerous air-filled alveoli form a spongy mass that is easily movable. Pneumothorax is a common result of injury to the chest and or lung with air or a combination of air and blood escaping into the pleural cavity. Associated rib fractures can also occur, so the abdomen is often secondary injured when the chest is injured. The abdomen, abdominal cavity is large, contains lots of structures that are fluid-filled, air-filled, solid, and even bony. So the air-filled and fluid-filled structures are more tolerant of the cavitation than are the solid ones. The extremities contain bone, muscle, blood vessels, and nerves. So bone injury from a projectile results in bony fragments becoming secondary missiles, lacerating surrounding vessels, muscles, and nerves, or even organs. The muscle expands, resulting in capillary tears and swelling. Now we've got to think about blast injuries. Okay? Blast injuries can occur because of explosions from different situations, such as those including natural gas, possibly gasoline, fireworks, improvised explosion devices, and then grain elevators. Regardless of the cause, every explosion has a primary, a secondary, a tertiary, a quaternary, and a quinary phase. The primary phase injuries are due to the pressure wave of the blast. So these injuries primarily affect gas-containing organs, such as the lungs, stomach, intestines, middle and inner ears, and sinus cavities. Severe damage and death can occur from this phase without any external sign of the injury at all. The secondary phase. Injuries are due to flying debris propelled by the force of the blast, or the blast, what they call the blast wind. In contrast, the injuries in the primary phase, the injuries of this phase, are obvious. Most common are lacerations from impaled objects, fractures, or even burns. Tertiary phase okay, includes injuries when the patient is thrown away from the source of the blast. So the injuries are much, much of the same as would be expected from ejection from a vehicle. Okay, the pattern depends on the distance thrown and the point of impact. Quaternary and quinary phase injuries result from structural collapse and exposure to chemicals, toxins, bacteria, metals, and or possibly radiation. Okay, approximately 90% of trauma patients have a simple, so such as fractured tibia or soft tissue laceration with no major bleeding. But a multi-system trauma patient has multiple injuries or involvement of more than one body system. The body systems can include the central nervous, pulmonary, cardiovascular, GI, urinary, reproductive, musculoskeletal, and integumentary, which is the skin. All right, so multiple organ systems and trauma, even though they may be part of the same body system, such as a small intestines or liver. Okay. Multi-system trauma carries a very, very high index of morbidi morbidity and mortality. It requires the EMT to respond quickly, provide a rapid assessment to identify immediately life-threatening injuries, manage any life threats, rapidly prepare the patient for transport, make the transport decision on whether this is the best for an ATU or a ground transport, and then expeditiously transport the patient to an appropriate facility. The golden period, okay, once known as referred to as the golden hour. However, some injured patients require definitive care in less than an hour to survive, whereas some patients can survive if care is provided beyond one hour. So some EMS systems refer to the platinum 10 minutes. This means that in case of severe trauma, 10 minutes in the maximum time the EMS team should devote to on-scene activities with patient assessment, emergency care for life threats, and preparation for transport all being accomplished in 10 minutes or less of arriving on scene. If a patient is not severely injured or is without any life-threatening medical problems, 
more time and should be devoted to completing normal on-scene assessment and emergency care before transport is decided. The key to determining whether the patient is or not severely injured is based on your assessment. So it is the patient's potential benefit to err on the side of un overestimating rather than underestimating. So the extent of the severity of the injuries is your call. So the harm that can be done by delaying transport when it is needed outweighs the good that can be done by completing an on-scene assessment and care at a more deliberate place. The trauma system is designed to provide immediate surgical intervention for patients with internal trauma if necessary. Extensive intensive care services specific to trauma and rehabilitation services. So level one trauma facility, which is a regional trauma facility here locally is Greenville Hospital System. In Spartanburg, it's Spartanburg Regional Healthcare. All right. So it is a regional trauma center that can manage all types of trauma 24 hours a day, seven days a week with on-call personnel. Okay, level two is an area trauma center. It can manage the vast majority of trauma with surgical capabilities 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They are capable of stabilizing more specialized trauma patients and then transferring them to a level one center. A level three hospital is a community trauma center that has some surgical capability and specially trained emergency department personnel to manage trauma. This type of center focuses on stabilizing the seriously injured trauma patient and then transferring to a higher level center. Level four okay, is a trauma facility. It's typically a small community hospital in a remote area capable, capable of stabilizing seriously injured trauma patients and then transferring them to a higher level trauma center. All right, again, if you're following along in your book, you'll see this guideline for field triage of injured patients. And we'll go over more of that in detail later on in one of the other lectures, okay? So as far as our principles of trauma care go, we're looking to ensure that all times the safety and EMS personnel, patients, and bystanders are being kept an eye on. Quickly determine the need for the additional resources at the scene. Determine the mechanism of injury, to connect the kinematics of trauma involved producing real or possible potential injuries and provide a primary assessment to identify and manage immediate life threats. Establish and maintain spine motion restriction for patients suspected of having a verte vertebral or spinal cord injury. Then we need to establish and maintain a patent airway, meaning open and free of obstructions or blood. Okay. Establish and maintain adequate oxygenation in the patient with an adequate rate and adequate tidal volume and hopefully keeping our SATs reading greater than 95%. Provide BVM ventilation with a high concentration of oxygen connected to a ventilation device in the patient with an inadequate respiratory rate or an inadequate tidal volume. Control external hemorrhage with direct pressure followed by a tourniquet if direct pressure is ineffective maintain a normal body temperature so we need to treat for shock splint fractures when appropriate ensure spine motion restriction precautions are taken transport critically injured or multi-system trauma patients within 10 minutes to the appropriate trauma facility according to the trauma triage criteria always follow your local regional or state destination protocols based on what hospitals in your area can take which patients. Obtain a history from the patient, relatives or bystanders if possible. Okay. Perform a secondary assessment to identify all other life-threatening or non-life-threatening injuries and manage each according to your priority. You must always remain alert for potential scene hazards. This might make it difficult for you to perform your care. So you have to think about being involved and traffic on the roadway, hazardous materials, hostile environments, an unsecured crime scene, sudden changes of the patient's behavior, shock from blood loss results in an inadequate delivery of oxygen to the cell. So this can cause the cells to convert to form aerobic to an anaerobic metabolism resulting in little energy production, acid accumulation, and eventually cellular dysfunction and death. So if a patient is losing a significant amount of blood to the delivery of oxygen and glucose to the cells is impaired. Hemoglobin is the red blood cell. Cell is primary mechanism for oxygen transport. So if you're losing hemoglobin because your patient's bleeding out, you're also losing oxygen. 
With any type of bleeding, red blood cells and hemoglobin are removed from the vessels, decreasing the oxygen carrying capability of the blood. This results in shock. Okay? There are times when you must deviate from the sequence to provide emergency care for a life threat, such as an example of an airway is always assessed before circulation in this sequence. However, if you identify a major bleed in arterial or venous during a general assessment, you have to first control the bleeding prior to moving on in the assessment. Okay, The definitive care for many seriously injured trauma patients is surgery. On-scene time should be limited to 10 minutes if possible. Rapid extrication should be used to remove the patient from the vehicle. En route, if time of the patient's condition permits, further stabilization of fractures can be accomplished through splinting. Taking the time at the scene to splint suspected fractures can delay transport and may contribute to the deterioration of the patient. Okay, an open humerus fracture with a bone protruding from the skin at a 90 degree angle will attract your attention. However, if the patient is alert, screaming in pain, you must assume that he has an adequate amount of energy, good perfusion, and an adequate amount of oxygen and glucose delivered to the cells. On the other hand, the patient sitting next to him who barely nods his head in response to your question of are you okay likely is lacking energy from inadequate perfusion. So you have to guess. Yes, the bone looks bad, but your patient is screaming, they're alert, they're oriented, and they're able to maintain their airway. So that is my least priority versus the someone who's altered and who doesn't have enough energy to scream and seems like they're having inadequate perfusion. So assessing your mechanism of injury is going to help predict potential injuries. Looking at the damage to the vehicle or looking at what the mechanism of injury was it a bat did they fall on a piece of rebar did they fall and hit a piece of concrete versus mulch okay that type of mechanism is going to help what kind of patterns of injuries you may have for this patient keep in mind that the mass isn't the worst it's the velocity all right and the amount of kinetic energy so the faster the velocity the worse the injury is going to be Trauma can be blunt or penetrating. Blunt meaning you get hit with a bat, you fall and slam the concrete, but there's no open injuries to the body that penetrated the skin. High velocity weapons are particularly prone to producing massive bodily injury. So we have to think trauma systems exist to allow rapid surgical intervention for severely injured patients. All right. Trauma triage criteria helps determine which patients should be transported to a trauma facility. You have to remember we have to do the most good for the most amount of patients in the least amount of time.